I read about Australian soldiers being hurt, but it didn't say who. It was actually Garth's sister that then rang me to say that it was him and he'd been injured. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The only thing I was scared of was failing, with letting down the people there that I was supposed to support. Things went south really bad. You've got to have an element of crazy to be good at what we do. There was an ego attached to being a gunfighter. Being around big tall trees, thick shrubbery, potentially connecting to other moments in his life during battle. The story of transformation is powerful. Welcome to another of our Partners episodes, where we're speaking with the partners of military veterans. Today's conversation goes back to one of our first interviews in 2017, Season 1, Number 3, Garth Callender. Garth deployed twice to Iraq and once to Afghanistan, in his first tour, when he was a junior cavalry officer. A bomb which was in a car parked on the side of the road detonated as we went past, so we were within a few metres of the bomb that, that went off making him Australia's first serious casualty of that campaign. Angus Horden spoke with Garth's wife, Crystal, about Crystal's perspective of being married to an army officer. I'm Angus Horden, speaking today with Crystal Callender. Crystal, welcome to Life on the Line. Thanks for having me, Angus. We're talking today, Crystal, about your experience of being a partner of a military veteran. To start, let's discuss your perceptions of the military before meeting Garth. Did you have any friends in the army or any military history in your family? Uh, No, not at all. I didn't actually have any idea about what life would be for someone in the army. It was all very new to me when I met Garth. My grandfather, I had been to some Anzac Day services with him. But as you know about veterans, they are very reluctant to talk about what they went through in the the older generation. So I don't know much about what my grandfather had done in the military. So as a child, I just remember going to a couple of Anzac Day services with him, but nothing more than that. When did you meet Garth and where was he in his army career at that point? I met Garth in Darwin through a mutual friend and he was a brand new young lieutenant. He'd just finished at Duntroon and he was on his first posting up in Darwin. And how did you feel when Garth's first deployment to Iraq came about? I was really, really nervous, to say the least. I think maybe a little bit naively nervous, more nervous that my boyfriend was going away and he wasn't going to be around. And I guess it was something... The actual seriousness of it was something that as a 20, I think I was about 21 or 22, I really couldn't understand that they were going off to a war zone. To me, it was more that he was just going to be away for four months and that to me wasn't, wasn't really great. And how long had you been with Garth at that stage? About a year and a half. We'd been engaged, so we got engaged just before he left. So there was kind of the excitement of we would get married when he came back. For him, he was going off on a bit of an adventure. And for me, I thought, well, if he's going to go away, I might go away too. So uh, (laughs) I decided that I'd um, go on a bit of a backpacking trip of Europe with some of my friends while he was off. So I was kind of in my head being really young, thinking he's going off having fun. I'm going to go off and have fun too. (laughs) It was scary at times. It was more the lack of contact I had with him. I wasn't able to pick up a phone and just talk to him. It was in 2004. Mobile phones weren't the same. We didn't have the smartphones like we do now. So we did have a mobile, but I could never call him and we didn't have the instant messaging that we do now. So it would just be a matter of waiting for the phone to ring. And the time zones were different. So often you'd miss a call. And when I was working, I was a theatre nurse. So I'd, I wouldn't ever have my phone on me. So I'd just come back to my locker and go, oh no, he rang about 45 minutes ago. And I'd stand around for a while hoping that he'd call back, but it wouldn't match up. So sometimes there'd be quite a few days or even up to a week before we would have contact with each other. So that was probably the hardest part. So you could imagine Garth 
queuing up behind guys to get access to a phone and then he calls you and you're in theatre or you're somewhere it must have been quite stressful to you. Yeah, it was. It was really hard. And when you're young, you're just used to having each other around all the time. And these days, I think people are so used to that instant communication that it would be even more difficult. I mean, then we knew that we'd only get a phone call when we could. But yeah, it was very challenging having to wait. October 25th, 2004 is a very memorable day for you both. That's when Garth's vehicle is struck by an IED. When did you first learn that Garth had been injured? When he had been injured and when I found out there was a little bit of a lag just due to the policies in place at the time which have now been changed but I was in London as I said I decided to go do a bit of backpacking and stay with friends and Because I was in England and not Australia, the news was different over there, so I didn't hear that Australian soldiers had been hurt. I was walking around Hyde Park with a friend and I got a phone call and they told me that there had been an incident involving Australian soldiers and that they would let us know in time who it was. And if we didn't hear from them, that meant it wasn't our family members. So at that stage, I really was like, oh, this isn't good. As I said, I turned on the TV, but there's nothing about Australian soldiers going on there. So I went to an internet cafe because back then you didn't just have Wi-Fi on your phone. (laughs) I had to go and log in in a cafe. And I read about Australian soldiers being hurt, but it didn't say who. And after a few hours, I didn't get any phone calls further. So I started to think, this is really bad, but as far as I know, it's not Garth. So then I started to wonder who else it might be and me being in England and the time difference in Australia. So it was actually Garth's sister that then rang me to say that it was him and he'd been injured. When were you able to go and visit him in hospital? One of the good things about the fact I decided to travel was that I was in England and the day that it happened, I was hopping on a plane to Spain. So when we found out it had happened, one of his friends was in the transport department and so she was the one that organised me getting straight to Germany. So I think I was with him within 24 to 48 hours after him being injured and flown out of Baghdad to Germany. So very quickly, whereas if I was in Australia, I probably would have just had to stay in Australia and wait for him to come back. So which medical facility was he in Germany? It was called Landstuhl and it was actually an American military base that was in the middle of Germany. Yeah, it was a really big military base hospital that was full of casualties from Iraq and it was really, really frightening place to be, actually. Obviously, the ordeal was horrific for Garth, but it would have equally been very challenging for you. Can you tell us about his recovery process and what was going on between the two of you at that time? Although the incident was really serious. He was lucky to have a very quick recovery. He got really good medical attention. After he was able to fly home, we flew from Germany to Sydney where he had some treatment with some ENT surgeons there. It was a long process with all the surgeries he needed to have, but luckily Physically, so his injuries were all from his shoulders up, so all in his head. So from his shoulders down, he was fine. So we could go for lots of walks and he was well otherwise. So we spent a lot of time together. So we were posted to Darwin, but he was treated in Sydney. So he went to stay with his sister who lived in Manly. So we got to spend a lot of time just walking and being reunited, I guess, after him being away and being relieved that... Although his injuries were serious, he was recovering really well. And also, being a nurse yourself, you would have a greater appreciation than most spouses of his care, his recovery, and that must have been very reassuring for you. Yeah, I think it definitely helped being a nurse and not being too horrified, I guess, by his injuries because they were all facial burns and lots of shrapnel wounds. So I was a theatre nurse, so I I definitely, I'm not queasy. (laughs) And yeah, I was able to understand anything the doctors were talking about in regards to surgery and able to help change his dressings and give medications. So yeah, it definitely helped. So when you come back to Sydney and you're in Manly, 
So you're moving towards summer and it's lovely to be in Manly at that time of year. So I can imagine that would have been, you know, at least pleasing from that perspective. It was great and we were lucky that we were able to go somewhere like Manly and to have the fresh air and the beaches accessible and Garth's family's there so that also helped to have his sister and mum there for support. Certainly being posted to the medical facility at Holdsworthy or something. Yeah, well, we did spend a few nights there (laughs) but uh, it was good to get out of there as quick as possible. So Garth recovers and you two enjoy some quality time together. But then Garth, your fiancé at that time, tells you that he actually wants to go back and deploy in Iraq again. Yeah, I was less than impressed with that. (laughs) I guess I thought, oh, well, he's been deployed and he's got hurt, so we won't do that again. You know, we've done that and he why would he want to go away again? But, of course, that's not really the thinking of a young soldier. They're in the military because... They want to be. He absolutely loved his job. And to him, he was thinking, well, part of my job is being deployed and going overseas with my troops, so I'm going to do that. I was really taken aback when he volunteered to go, but to him it was a bit of a, well, I didn't get to do the job properly last time and I want to go back and do it again. So military spouses get very used to just going with the flow (laughs) and knowing that your partner, I guess they're not, ordinary people that think well they do think logically but they they love their job and they want to be out there doing the best that they can do so to him that was putting his hand up to say yes I'll go back and do you mind me asking did he make the call without consulting you yeah because it was a surprise to me but I mean as he always says I definitely thought about you and I guess he knew I would be all right because I was all right but yeah it's it's always disappointing to not disappointing but it's hard to hear that they've chosen something over you but that's just part of the relationship and now we're in the absolutely total opposite end of the scale where we work at home together. (laughs) So years of being apart is now flipped and we're together all the time now. And I should just clarify that's on account of the coronavirus which is affecting the world and here we are in April 2020 in case people listen to this in a decade's time and and wonder what you're referring to. (laughs) Did you get married before or after he deployed? We got married before he deployed the second time. So we got married in late 2005 and he deployed in early 2006, I think. How was the experience of being separated this time, especially after what had happened to him? And you're very aware that people can get hurt. And in fact, it was your boy that got hurt. Yeah, I was definitely on edge the second time. I I can't say I enjoyed the experience very much. I did take on a new job, a new role at work as a nurse in a cardiac cath lab where they do arterial stenting. That really took my mind off it. I was on call a lot. It was a lot of um, new information I was learning at work. So I studied a lot. I immersed myself in work. We were in Brisbane at the time and I grew up on the Gold Coast. So I was close to friends. You just really have to keep yourself busy and keep your mind off it. So Garth returns home safe and sound, thankfully. You get to settle into married life and your first daughter, Eva, is born in 2007. We've been talking a lot about the challenges of being with an army man. What are some of the positives about being married to someone who serves in the military? I think there's a lot of positives. And um, as Garth and I always say, we really, despite the things that have happened, we both enjoyed his time in the army. I really enjoyed moving around and getting to live in all these other locations that I never would have experienced. It is very, despite your partner being away, it's quite family orientated. There's a lot of family events, meeting in the mess. You meet lots of other people that are in the same situation. I remember when I was in the military, I used to enjoy the mess dinners. And I imagine you would have equally had many of those and barbecues and those friendships that you generated with them. Have you still got them today? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's one thing we've been able to show our children is when you move, it doesn't mean you're leaving people. It's just you're going somewhere and you make a whole new lot of friends. But every time we go away, we'll visit people that we know from 
Garth time in the military and we keep in contact with lots of people and our kids now have friends of other military families. So I think it's very positive in that regard, more so than any other job that I've been in is less family focused. So how many kids do you currently have, Crystal? So we now have three daughters. Great. And how old are they? So Eva is now 12, Zoe is 10, and Amelia is 6. And have they expressed any interest in following dad or mum in your medical career or, or his military career? Definitely no one wants to be a nurse. They all hate to have blood and guts. <laughs> there hasn't been any interest in joining the military yet. They do joke every now and then they all love the water. So they're like, why didn't you join the Navy, Dad? And oh, that brings out a whole nother discussion. <laughs> well, actually, there are a lot more women in the Navy than other services. So there's a great opportunity there. I recall from our original interview with Garth that you were pregnant while he was deployed in Afghanistan. And it was very lucky that he got home just in time for the birth. Yes. So he arrived home actually four days before Zoe was born. I mean, we did time it like that. We knew that there was a possibility he might miss it, but we crossed our fingers that he'd make it back, and he did. It's funny, you know how you've always got this due date that the doctor gives you, and most people either come a bit earlier or come a bit later, but no one's ever on the due date. Yes. <laughs> um, but that's great that he could. I could imagine that leaving a war zone, getting home in time to see you both, especially before the birth, would have been a, a wonderful thing for him, and indeed you. Garth has been out of the regular army for some time now, but I suppose in some form or another, the military part of his life will always be in your day to day. And indeed, he's still serving with the reserves. Yes, he very much, as I mentioned, he enjoyed his time in the military and he still does. So being on the Gold Coast, he um, goes up to Canungra or Brisbane to do some reserve work. And I guess he's got a lot to offer still to the military and it's definitely that mateship that you don't get in any other industry that I think keeps him going back. The military will always be a part of our lives. It's the basis of his business and what he does now. And yeah, as I said, we have so many fond memories of our time in the military. Are there any key lessons or reflections that you'd like to share with partners and families of veterans who are listening to this podcast? Oh, I think you have to be a patient person. <laughs> you have to be, for partners, I guess, comfortable on your own for long periods of time. And I guess you also, one thing I would say to new partners that are new to the military is you do have to put yourself out there, I think, and make contact with other partners. You can't just sit at home and be lonely. So you've got to be someone that will take the time to go and meet other partners and you'll get a lot from that. I think they're a really great group of people. You'll have a lot probably more in common than you think when you meet up with them. Crystal, it's interesting. We've been talking to lots of veterans over many, many years. If I was to think how this relationship between the two of you could have survived those terrible things, he was very lucky hooking up with you because you were the right person for him quite clearly. You have a loving and supportive partnership. And Crystal, we'd like to thank you very much for coming and sharing your experience and wonderful story with us today. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Angus. It's been really nice chatting with you and yeah, it's been a little bit of time since Garth left the army, so it's nice to think back on those times when he was in there. We took this opportunity of speaking with Crystal to also catch up with Garth, as it's been a few years since the original interview. This is his brief chat with Angus. I'm Angus Horton, and today we're talking with Garth Callender again. Garth, Great to see you, and please tell us your news. I think the last time we spoke, I was running the Veterans Employment Program in New South Wales State Government. So I, I spent a lot of time talking about veterans and their skills and how employable they are. And I, I think since then, I've, I decided to put my money where my mouth is, and I've gone out and started my own business based around largely on the skills that I've learned in the military and how I've been able to put them into a way that corporates and business leaders can use them, so specifically around crisis management, but also more broadly around strategy development. You're also doing some time with the reserves. I am. So I've been really lucky. I, I've, my career has been able to progress, even in a part-time capacity these days. So I've, you know, I've been chuffed. I just recently got promoted, so I'm, I'm a lieutenant colonel now and doing some, some pretty interesting work. 
So as a Lieutenant Colonel, are you going to Canungra or, or Brisbane or whereabouts are you doing your work? Yeah, I'm working out of Headquarters 1 Division up in Brisbane, capturing some of the the lessons of current rotations through Middle East and through the Southwest Pacific, things like that. So we get smarter as an army and we don't keep making the same mistakes and we learn from what's gone well and what we can what we can improve on. Yeah, there are um, a lot of servicemen and women that have been deployed, had bad experiences one way or the other, and come back and people handle it in different ways. Now, you're a great example of someone who suffered great adversity, but with respect has been glass half full, been able to get back into life. Are there some things that you could share with our listeners that have helped you in that process that could help them? First of all, I'll say that I was extremely lucky in the fact that whilst I had some pretty serious injuries, I recovered from them. So yes, I've got a few quirks from that. My wife talks about my rugged Mediterranean good looks, which we can attribute to the bomb blast. But yeah, I was lucky in the fact that it didn't stop my career. I was able to continue serving, which I did for, a, you know, I, I still am in a part-time capacity. So that's been extremely beneficial. I took my experiences and worked out how I could best feed them back in to help others, you know, even when I came back from, from Baghdad the first time, quite badly injured, the next year or so, I spent a lot of time assisting in the training of the rotations about to go into Baghdad, doing the same job that I'd been doing. Understand the realities of what they're going into, but understanding and, and refining the training so they're best prepared, best protected. I'd like to think that's that theme has carried on throughout. So the work that I did post that, the work that I did in counter IED, you know, looking at, looking at bombs, it was to use my knowledge and experience to help protect people. And then even now in a professional sense, I like to think that my experiences I can feed back into corporate leadership teams and I've got the, the capacity to feed back into the military still. So Garth, that's a great example of where guys have left war theatre and then come back and then gone into some form of business and working for yourself gives you that flexibility. Obviously, it is a big jump of faith because you no longer have that weekly check from the regular employer. But if you back yourself, you're using all that military expertise. And I recall how you explained to us in our original discussion, the army has put a massive investment into you and therefore what an asset that is and what a crying shame it is not to use it. Yeah, absolutely. And I look at my feelings on risk, which I think even at a really professionally young age, I'd been exposed to a real risk. It's not that governance and compliance piece. In a military sense, it's not, you know, the greatest risk isn't getting marked down on your annual report or getting yelled at by your commanding officer. Real risk is flesh and blood. And I understood that. So I've been really lucky. And I am able to communicate that now into into a business sense for a lot of people. Not necessarily always health and safety impacts, but, you know, it's executive teams and boards understanding that behind every risk are people whether it's financial, whether it's compliance, litigation, whether it's, you know, HR, succession planning, all that sort of stuff, at the end of the day, it always comes back to people. So Garth, for our youth of today, having gone through what you have done, what would you say about a career in the military? My mum was always, in fact, my entire family was off me joining the military when I did and kind of getting injured justified their thoughts on it. But to be honest, it's been a great career. Yes, it's had its ups and downs, but the experience that I've had, the friendships that I've made, you just can't match that with any other job ever. And then on top of that, and something which is not really well understood right now, is the professional development. No other organisation invests in their people like the military does. Unfortunately, right now, we're still grappling with how that translates into civilian roles because it, civilian employers don't understand that very well and can't translate what military skills, how they plug into their civilian organisation. And military people aren't that good at explaining it either. So it's taken me, what, five years, six years working in both public and private sector to really understand how to express my skills and experience and where they best support civilian organisations. Garth, I remember when we finished our initial interview years ago and I said, we look forward to hearing your news and how you develop. Well, it's great to hear how you've developed already and we look forward again to talking to you in the future and hearing more great things from you, Garth Callender. Thanks, Angus. And it's really good to keep in touch. Thanks very much. I'm Angus Horton and you've been listening to Life on the Line. Our warm thanks go to Crystal for coming on the show to share her story, and to Garth for making another return appearance. Angus first spoke with Garth in 2017. 
My vehicles are closest to the blast. Getting yourself blown up does some interesting things to you. We then brought Garth back in 2018, season two, to our first veterans panel discussion called Panel Returning Home. We're defined by the media and Mm. by Hollywood. Follow this podcast at Life on the Line Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and at LOTL Pod on Twitter. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget.